Hello and welcome to this webinar on IFRS 16 research opportunities. I'm Catherine Donkersley and I'm joined today by my colleagues Petrina Buchanan and Anna Simpson and IASB member Anne Tarker. A couple of practical points to mention before we get started. The slides from this session are available on the IFRS Foundation website. There's a link to these right next to the webinar registration link that you used. If you have a question you'd like to ask, then there's a text box to the left of your screen to do that. Just type your question, click on submit, and it will come through to us here. Finally, it's important to note that as always, the views expressed during this webinar are those of myself and the other presenters. They are not necessarily the views of the IASB or the IFRS Foundation. The purpose of this webinar is firstly to provide a brief overview of IFRS 16, the LEAFI standard and its requirements. We'll then talk about potential research opportunities. The opportunities we'll be describing today are on topics that would be helpful to the board in informing its upcoming post-implementation review of IFRS 16. We'll save some time at the end of the webinar for questions from the audience. So first, an overview of IFRS 16 and its requirements. The standard was issued back in January 2016, and it became effective for annual reporting periods beginning on or after the 1st of January 2019. That means companies with a 31st of December year end are now entering their third year of IFRS 16 reporting. IFRS 16 replaced the previous leases standard, IAS 17, and as we talk through the requirements, we'll highlight the key differences between the old and new leases standard. At a high level though, the key change brought about by IFRS 16 was that it requires a lessee to recognize almost all leases on the balance sheet. This was a big change because before applying IAS 17, many leases were classified as operating leases. They were not recognized on the balance sheet. Instead, payments for those leases were recognized as rental expenses through profit and loss. In terms of lessors, very little has changed. That's because IFRS 16 substantially retained the previous accounting requirements. The feedback the board heard about lessors demonstrated that Unlike for lessees, the costs of making any substantial changes to the accounting would have outweighed the benefits. Later on in the webinar, we have one slide where we'll talk a little about lessor accounting. Otherwise, everything we'll talk about in this session relates to lessees. So next we have a couple of slides that summarize why the board decided it was necessary to change lessee accounting. The board's upcoming post-implementation review will focus on how effective IFRS 16 has been at achieving its objectives. So understanding why the board developed the standard in the first place is really important. Katrina, can I turn to you to give us the background? Sure. So the board is of the view that all leases provide a source of financing and that lessees obtain assets and incur liabilities when they enter into leases. Now that view is shared by a lot of the board's stakeholders. Most investors and analysts that provided feedback during the leases project told us that in their view, leases create debt-like obligations for a lessee. Now, contrary to that, however, most leases were off balance sheet, applying the previous leases standard IS-17. The board performed research about the problems that existed as a result of that accounting. And one thing the board found 
was that over 85% by value of lease liabilities were not reported on company balance sheets because they were classified as operating leases. Now that meant that a significant amount of what investors view as debt-like liabilities were missing from companies' balance sheets. And because of this, investors and analysts really faced several difficulties when trying to understand information reported by lessees applying IS-17. So firstly, they struggled to get an accurate picture of lease assets and liabilities because for operating leases, those amounts didn't appear on the balance sheet. Secondly, they found it difficult to compare companies that lease assets with those that buy similar assets. And again, that's mainly because assets arising from operating leases didn't appear on a lessee's balance sheet. And finally, investors and analysts didn't have enough information to reasonably estimate the amount of off-balance sheet lease obligations. Now, we understand that some investors made rough estimates, but in many of those cases, they actually overestimated the amount of lease obligations. So slide seven now provides you with some real examples of the lack of information that resulted from the old method of accounting for operating leases. And this slide shows six retailers that went into liquidation, along with the amount of off-balance sheet obligations that those retailers held in respect of leases. Now taking HMV, for example, this entity had an amount of off-balance sheet debt but even on a discounted basis, was seven times greater than its on-balance sheet debt. Now, of course, what I can't say um, is that the off-balance sheet debt was the reason that all of these companies ended up in liquidation. What I can say, however, is that when we performed this research as we developed the leases standard, every retailer we looked at that had gone into liquidation showed these high levels of off-balance sheet debt. And it wasn't the case that we actually had to go hunting for this result. So all of these retailers that had gone into liquidation had significant lease obligations that were not reflected on the balance sheet, a potentially significant lack of information. For example, an investor relying on data aggregation of balance sheet amounts may not have been aware of all of those obligations. And further, comparing the balance sheets of retailers that lease assets and those that might buy similar assets could have been misleading. So for example, one of these companies with significant operating leases would have appeared to have a very different asset turnover ratio to a similar retailer that owned its assets. Now, because of these problems with the information reported about leases applying IS-17, the ISB decided to make a number of changes to lessee accounting. The board's objectives were really to address the issues I just described. So in summary, the board was aiming to provide transparency about lease assets and liabilities, and was also aiming to improve comparability between companies. And we'll come back to these two themes when we talk about potential research opportunities later in the webinar. So the next two slides provide a high level overview of the requirements for lessees. IFRS 16 requires a lessee to bring almost all leases onto the balance sheet, and that's with a couple of limited exceptions. That means a lessee entering into a lease is required to recognise two things. A right of use asset representing the rights the lessee has with respect to the underlying asset in the contract and a liability reflecting its obligation to make payments to the lessor throughout the lease term. Once on the balance sheet, a lessee accounts for the assets and the liability in the same way it would account for any other non-current asset or financial liability. That is, it recognises depreciation on the right of use asset and repayments and interest as the lease liability winds down. 
This slide summarises the effect of applying IFRS 16 on a lessee's primary financial statements. For all lessees that had IAS 17 operating leases, applying IFRS 16 increased the gross amount of their assets and liabilities. That was because amounts previously were disclosed only in the operating lease commitment footnotes, but are now recognised on the balance sheet. The other primary financial statements were also affected by IFRS 16. Now that assets and liabilities are recognised for all leases, rental costs previously recognised for operating leases have been effectively replaced by depreciation on the leased asset and interest on the lease liability. Comparing that to reporting under IAS 17, it affected both the income statement and the cash flow statement by increasing financing costs and finance cash outflows and decreasing operating expenses and operating cash outflows. This means that operating profit and operating cash flow are both higher than they were applying IAS 17. However, in terms of the bottom line of the P&L, little is expected to change. At a high level, that's because the total costs and cash flows associated with a lease are unchanged. The accounting has changed, but the economics has not. IFRS 16 accounting was intended to better reflect those same economics. Now, what might change is the profile of recognising total lease expenses over time. Before, operating lease rental expenses tended to be recognised on a straight line basis. Applying IFRS 16, lease liabilities, like all other financial liabilities, will incur more interest in the early years than the later years, and this would affect the P&L. However, most companies that enter into leases tend to enter into lots and lots of leases, and if a company has a portfolio of contracts all starting and ending at different times, that interest front loading effect that I've just described is likely to balance out across the portfolio leaving the bottom line of the P&L largely unchanged, as you can see on the slide. Now, the next few slides go into a bit more detail on some of the more significant aspects of IFRS 16. First, we have the definition of a lease. Now, this is very important because it is the definition of a lease that determines whether a contract should be accounted for applying IFRS 16 at all. The definition of a lease is based on whether a contract conveys the right to control the use of an identified asset for a period of time in exchange for consideration. If the contract does convey that control to the customer, then the contract contains a lease and it should be accounted for as a lease. If, on the other hand, control of the asset remains with the supplier, the contract does not contain a lease and would typically be accounted for as a service by recognising costs through profit and loss as they are incurred. Of course, the need to identify a lease also existed applying IAS 17. So before getting into the detail here, let's run this poll question, which asks whether you think applying IFRS 16 instead of IAS 17 would be expected to result in more leases, less leases, or a similar number of leases as before. You should be able to vote on that question on your screen right now. Whilst the audience votes, Katrina, definition of a lease got a huge amount of discussion whilst the board was developing the standard, and it's also been something of a hot topic during implementation. Do you have any insight for us on why this has been such a big deal for stakeholders? <laughs> 
Sure. Um, thank you, Catherine. The definition of a lease is actually one of my favourite topics, so I, I, I like to talk about it. So, yes, yeah, so a, a very good question. Why has this been such a big topic? Because, as you said, companies have always had to determine whether or not a contract contains a lease. So it's not a new concept. However, it has proven to be a big topic in IFRS 16 because distinguishing between leases and services now has a much more significant effect on the financial statements. Applying IS 17, operating leases and services were accounted for very similarly because operating leases were not recognised on the balance sheet. The only real difference was that an operating lease would be included in the relevant footnote disclosures, whereas the service would not. Now applying I for a 16, the difference in accounting between a lease and a service is very different. A lease will be on balance sheet, whilst a service will not. Therefore, the distinction has a much more significant effect on the financial statements, and we are aware that stakeholders are now focusing on the definition of a lease much more than they have in the past. So if we now turn to um, the question then and see the results. Catherine, I'm going to ask you to tell me about the results because I'm afraid I'm not seeing them at the moment. Oh, okay. So uh, we have in the results, which I'm just uh, sending to the audience, 63% of the audience thought that you will get more leases applying IFRS 16, uh, and then we had about 20% each for less leases and a similar number of leases. Oh, fantastic. How, how interesting. So, so maybe let me comment on that, because I think there's there's possibly reason for all three answers, but what I will tell you all then that the correct answer um, is actually C. The expectation uh, would be that there would be a similar number of leases, um, you know, applying I-17 and applying IFRS 16. Um, and why is that? Well, that's because in practical terms, IFRS 16 didn't change the definition of a lease very much at all. So that's why we'd, we would have expected um, C uh, to be the answer, a similar number. Now, what IFRS 16 does is it actually provides much more detail in this area than IS 17 did and the related interpretation of FRIC 4. And that's really because of the increased importance of this distinction between a lease and a service that I've just described. Now, in the vast majority of cases, it will be clear whether the contract contains a lease or is a service. That was true under IS 17, and it continues to be true under IFRS 16. But there will be a minority of cases, sometimes for, for leases of individually very, very significant assets, where the distinction will be more challenging. Um, and, and in those minority of cases, the additional requirements and application guidance on IFRS 16 are useful in making the distinction. And IFRS 16 also includes quite a few illustrative examples to help in this respect as well. Now, in terms of practical differences between IFRS 16 and IS 17, there are one or two scenarios that would result in a lease conclusion under IS 17, but a service under IFRS 16, and none for which the reverse is expected to be true. So that's why I said there, there is possibly a, a reason why th there could be a smaller number of leases applying IFRS 16 compared to IS 17. However, overall, as we said, we would ex have expected that to be that difference to really be very narrow. And overall, we would have said that, that there should be a similar number of leases applying IFRS 16 compared to IS 17. That said, however, in terms of practical outcomes and some of the initial um, findings that we've seen from applying IFRS 16 um, fit into what 63% of you thought, 
that actually there is a slightly different result, I think, happening potentially from what we expected. And that is um, that that some companies are finding that IFRS 16, under IFRS 16 or applying it, there are actually more leases being identified. And we think that's really because of the increased attention that companies, auditors and others are paying to the lease service distinction. So we've heard that as a result of implementing IFRS 16, some companies have identified leases that they perhaps didn't identify before. And for that reason, the population of leases recognised in the financial statements might have increased. Now, I think this is really an important point to note when thinking about the objectives of the standard. Because the implementation of IFRS 16 has led companies to identify and recognise leases that had not been identified previously, then that would suggest that implementation of IFRS 16 has increased transparency of information for those contracts. Thanks, Petrina. Um, moving on then, uh, the audience has probably noticed that we have several times referred to almost all leases being recognised on the balance sheet. And that use of almost all is because the standard contains two optional recognition exemptions for leases of less than 12 months and leases for which the underlying asset is of low value. The board decided to include these optional recognition exemptions because for these leases, the board concluded that the costs of recognising assets and liabilities on the balance sheet would outweigh the reporting benefits of including them. Companies often have very high volumes of these leases, but the assets and liabilities arising from them are often immaterial. Applying IFRS 16, lessees can choose to account for these leases similarly to old operating leases and not recognise them on the balance sheet. All of the board's research suggested that the effect of these optional recognition exemptions is unlikely to be material for most companies. An important part of the standard is the requirements about how a lessee measures its lease liabilities. In summary, a lessee identifies all of the lease payments that will be made during the lease term and applies an appropriate discount rate to those lease payments to arrive at the lease liability. Let's first mention discount rates. The appropriate rate to use could be one of two things. First, the rate implicit in the lease. This is effectively the rate that the lessor has used to price the contract. In a simple case, it would be the rate that, if used to discount all of the lease payments over the lease term, would arrive back to the fair value of the right of use asset provided to the lessee at the start of the contract. If a lessee can readily determine the rate implicit in the lease, then that's the rate it should use as the discount rate for initial measurement of its lease liability. If, however, a lessee cannot readily determine the rate implicit in the lease, then it should instead use its incremental borrowing rate for the lease. Now, IFRS 16 defines this rate as the rate the lessee would have to pay to borrow over a similar term and with a similar security the funds necessary to obtain an asset of similar value to the right of use asset in a similar economic environment. Now that's something of a mouthful but in simpler terms we're essentially saying the rate the lessee would have to pay for borrowings with similar characteristics to those of the lease. Now, discount rate is one part of the lease liability measurement. The other is exactly which payments should be included at all. The general principle applied under IFRS 16 is that the amount of the lease liability should reflect those payments that are unavoidable for the lessee. So first, all fixed lease payments are included. And that includes, for example, any inflation-linked payments 
because those are unavoidable and do not depend on any future activity of the lessee. Secondly, the lease liability includes any optional payments if the lessee is reasonably certain to make these payments. Now, this might include payments relating to extension or termination options. It might also include termination penalties if the lease term reflects an option to terminate the lease that the lessee would have to pay to use. The reasonably certain threshold in IFRS 16 is the same as that in IAS 17. For the avoidance of doubt, the lease liability excludes any optional payments that a lessee is not reasonably certain to make, and that's because a lessee could avoid those payments. The lease liability also includes amounts expected to be paid under residual value guarantees. Again, that's because these payments cannot be avoided by a lessee. One final point to mention is that the lease liability does not include variable lease payments linked to sales or use of the underlying asset. This is partly for cost benefit reasons, but it's also because many consider these payments to be avoidable by the lessee. Bringing all of that together then, uh, here we have a poll question about measuring the lease liability. What you can see on your screen right now describes a four-year lease of a retail store with a fixed rental payment each year plus 10% of sales made out of the store. The contract also contains a termination option or a break clause at the end of year two. So the poll question is, how do you think this should be accounted for? I'll just hold off a minute before talking more through the question to give you a chance to vote on the poll, which should be on your screen now. So I can uh, see that people are voting. Uh, I'm going to, to start working through the question, uh, but I won't reveal the answer just yet. So, so do keep your votes coming. <laughs> so there are three things going on in this question. First, we have the fixed payments each year of 10,000 in the first year, 11,000 in the second, and so on. Fixed payments need to be included in the lease liability for the duration of the lease term. The second thing going on in this question is variable payments. Now, as the variable payments in this example depend on sales arising from the underlying asset, they are not included in the lease liability. Finally, we have the lease term. And in this example, we do not have enough information to conclude on exactly what that is. That's because we do not know whether the lessee is reasonably certain to take the longer available lease term. If, for example, the rent in years three and four is favorable compared to market rates, the lessee would have a good economic reason to continue in the lease in years three and four and would conclude itself reasonably certain to do that. In this case, the lease term would be four years long and the lease liability would include all fixed payments for the whole four years, i.e. 46,000. However, in the absence of that kind of reasonable certainty, the lease term would be two years and the lease liability would only be 21,000. Uh, therefore, the answer to the question is, it depends, uh, and it's answer C. Uh, I can see that we had a mix of all the answers on that poll, although the majority did get it right. Um, I am going to send the poll results right now, so they should become visible on your screen. Now, this point about lease term 
is another area that we could really describe as something of an IFRS 16 hot topic. Petrina, can I go to you again to talk a bit about why that is? Of course. Um, thank you, Catherine. Um, so, lease term is another area where, in theory, not much has changed compared to IS-17. The concept of reasonably certain was also in IS-17. And in fact, the board kept that term because stakeholders told us it was well understood. However, much like our earlier discussion on the definition of a lease, the reasonably certain assessment became much more important when IFRS 16 was applied. Before, under IS 17, if you had a two-year lease instead of a four-year lease, the financial reporting effect was the absence of lease payments in years three and four from the operating lease commitment footnote. Applying IFRS 16, that same conclusion affects the lease payments recognised on the balance sheet. And so really that lease term then assessment directly affects the amount a lessee recognises on the balance sheet. And for this reason, judgment around whether a lessee is reasonably certain to use an optional period in a lease has become much more important and companies, auditors and others are paying much closer attention to that distinction. And in some cases, that means lessees might be recognising longer lease terms now than they were previously, including in their operating lease commitment footnote. Now, another reason why lease term is an important topic is because things like extension and termination options can introduce complexity to a company's lease portfolio that investors are likely to want to know about. The same is true of areas such as variable payments and residual value guarantees. So as well as being important in terms of measurement, these topics also come up in the IFRS 16 disclosure requirements. So imagine, for example, that a lessee has a lot of lease extension options that it has concluded it is not reasonably certain to exercise. So those optional payments are not therefore recognised on the lessee's balance sheet. Or that it has sales-based variable payments that are not recognised on the balance sheet. In these cases, the lessees would have potential exposure to lease payments beyond those recognised in the primary financial statements that investors would want to know about. Uh, so before we move on to talk about research opportunities, uh, a quick word on lessors. We mentioned at the beginning that IFRS 16 did not really change lessor accounting. Investors are broadly happy with lessor accounting as it is, and so the board concluded that the costs of making significant changes would outweigh any potential benefits. That said, the board did make a couple of tweaks to lessor accounting. Most notably, this related to subleases. The board had to do this to ensure sensible accounting in a scenario in which an entity leases an asset as lessee and then subleases that same asset out as lessor. The other change that's worth mentioning is some enhancements to the disclosure requirements for lessors. Whilst we heard that, lessor, that investors were happy with the accounting, they did note some areas where they felt disclosure information was lacking. The main example of this was information about risks associated with the residual asset that a lessor is left with at the end of a lease. So IFRS 16 requires some information to be disclosed in this area that was not required by IAS 17. So with that summary, Anna, can we turn to you to talk about research opportunities? Of course, thank you, Katrin. As highlighted earlier in the quote by Hans, the objectives of IFRS 16 are 
first to increase transparency of information about lease assets and liabilities and second, to improve the comparability between companies that lease and companies that borrow to buy assets. So the main task of the post-implementation review is to assess whether IFRS 16 is achieving these objectives and therefore research evidence on the impact of IFRS 16 on companies' transparency and comparability will inform the board how well the standard is working. And Therefore, the board is looking for papers that uh, essentially address the cost benefits analysis of the standard. Let's focus first uh, on the objective of transparency. And uh, examples of research questions here would relate to the financial impact of the capitalization of leases in the financial statement. Uh, changes in companies' reporting of leases following the implementation of IFRS 16, disclosure practices of companies applying IFRS 16 uh, compared to those applying IES 17, and the effects of increased transparency for companies. I will now uh, provide um, some uh, more examples or of uh, specific questions, although th these will be only illustrative and any research assessing the transparency uh, while on that topic would be useful. So on the financial impact of uh, the capitalization of leases, the board, uh, for example, would be interested in uh, the proportion of companies now recognizing lease assets and liabilities on the balance sheet that were not recognized applying IS 17, and also what is the approximate total value of lease assets and liabilities recognized as a result of IFRS 16 implementation. We saw uh, from the results of the first polling question that um, uh, the majority of you expected that some companies may identify uh, more leases than were previously reported when applying IES 17. And as Patrina explained, this is because of uh, likely of the increased attention that companies, auditors and others are paying to the lease um, service distinction. Therefore, it would be um, useful for the board to, uh, to know um, to, to have some evidence on this based on real data and uh, have some insights on the magnitude and, and the consequences of these uh, changes. So uh, related uh, to disclosure, examples of specific uh, research questions uh, include how IFRS 16 disclosures compared to the information provided um, applying IES 17 in other words, are IFRS 16 disclosures more useful? Are companies providing disclosures about complex lease portfolios and lease exposures that are not uh, reflected on the balance sheet? And uh, also the board would be interested in evidence that documents the effects of increased uh, transparency for companies. For instance, uh, whether there are any learning effects such as um, companies identifying and uh, discontinuing obsolete uh, lease contracts or companies changing their accounting or lease management practices as a result of uh, implementing IFRS 16. So now um, I will turn to Katrin to run um, another polling question and then I will uh, come back to talk about uh, the uh, research opportunities related to the second objective of IFRS 16. The second polling question is, uh, the third polling question is, in a 2019 survey, what proportion of companies identified additional leases or longer lease terms after implementing IFRS 16? 
Um, thank, thanks, Anna. And with apologies to the audience and a demonstration that this is an, indeed a live webinar, I had my mute button pressed for a couple of minutes there. So, so, you, so uh, apologies for the brief silence. Um, I can see that there are quite a few votes on the question already. Just to say that, as you can imagine, in the years since we issued IFRS 16 and as companies have implemented it, we've heard what I would call anecdotal feedback about its impact. And on this question of the importance um, of the least service distinction and the least term reasonably certain assessment, one of the things we've heard is about companies that have indeed identified additional stuff beyond what was in their operating lease commitment note to recognise on the balance sheet. Um, so we've had quite a few answers already. Uh, so I will share the results of the survey with you. Uh, all of the possible options uh, got some responses and I can tell you that the majority of you were right that just over half of companies that were involved in this survey had identified additional uh, leases or longer lease terms to put on their balance sheet as a result of IFRS 16 implementation. Similarly, on the theme of transparency, I've just opened another poll that relates to the point that Anna mentions um, on what I will refer to as internal transparency for companies themselves. Um, so really, what this poll is asking is in a, in a similar survey where we heard feedback from companies about their implementation, what proportion felt that as a result of implementing IFRS 16, their internal reporting information had improved to an extent that enabled them to have better portfolio visibility and, and better sort of asset decision making. Um, so to, to give an example of the kind of thing we've heard on this, I've, I've heard companies say, well, you know, in, in the past, the operating lease commitment that was on page 200 of the management reporting pack, and it was in note 28 of the accounts, whereas now that information needs to be right there up front on the balance sheet. Um, in many cases, companies used to use Excel systems or, or other things to monitor their operating leases, whereas now they have implemented systems um, that, that, that give them more information. So as well as the financial reporting benefits for external reporting, that has also enabled companies to have more transparency about what they're dealing with lease-wise internally. Uh, so again, we've had a good number of votes. Uh, I'm going to send the results now. Uh, the majority of you thought the answer to this one was 32%. Uh, I can reveal, and I promise I'm not making this up, that actually it's 52% again. So as before, just over half of companies found that this internal transparency benefit existed when they implemented the new leases standard. Um, so can I go back to you, Anna, to uh, talk through comparability? Thank you, Katrin. Moving on to the other objective of IFRS 16, to assess whether IFRS 16 is achieving its objective of improving comparability between companies, helpful evidence uh, for the board would be um, to examine whether IFRS 16 implementation has affected investors' ability to compare companies that lease assets with companies that buy similar assets and also companies across different industries. Another relevant question is whether IFRS 16 implementation is associated with real effects, that is, whether it has affected companies' decisions to buy or lease assets. And finally, it would be informative for the board to have evidence on whether the options offered in IFRS 16 such as optional recognition exemptions, accounting for lease and associated service components as a single component, or the transition options available to companies have affected comparability in any material way. So um, this uh, concludes uh, the overview of uh, the IFRS 16 requirements and the related research opportunities. Uh, we have approximately 15 minutes to take some questions. 
And uh, while I take a look at the questions that uh, we have received, uh, uh, let me pick one of the research opportunities that I just talked about and ask Katrin to give us some more detail on the type of evidence that would be informative to the board. For example, um, how do you see researchers addressing the question of whether IFRS 16 implementation has affected investors' ability to compare companies? Uh, oh, thanks, Anna. That is um, a great question and, of course, relates to, to one of the, the, the most fun fundamental objectives of the standard. Um, I'm going to start with a caveat, which says that I uh, will own up and be very proud of the fact that I'm an accounting geek. Uh, I am not, however, an academic. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to share a couple of thoughts now, but I have no doubt that there will be people in the audience um, who, whose expertise would, would only add to, to, to what I'm about to say uh, and include better ideas, which is precisely why we, we really do appreciate input um, on these areas. Uh, so on the question of investors' ability to compare companies, I mean, the first thing I would say is that there is direct evidence that would be out there in terms of literally evidence directly from investors. Uh, so whether research could involve interviews, surveys, but asking investors about their experiences in comparing companies um, after IFRS 16 was implemented by them. Um, the other area I'd talk about here uh, would be all about ratios, and there, there are several things I could say here, um, but th there's many ways if you were to, to be researching and looking at companies both before and after IFRS 16 implementation and trying to compare those that lease to those that buy, for example, there are many ways in which ratios could, could, could help you come up with a, a method to do that. So, for example, if you think about um, the, the old world applying IAS 17, a company that leased all of its assets under operating leases would have no assets on its balance sheet uh, relating to those leases, yet it might be generating similar turnover from use of those assets to a company that had bought them. And if you were to compare the asset turnover ratios of those two companies, uh, they, they really wouldn't be giving comparable information at all. Moving to an IFRS 16 world then, there's two different ways in which this might be explored looking at financial statements. One is the fact that right of use assets have been brought onto the balance sheet. So that introduces a, a much more meaningful set of ratios when comparing to companies that buy. Uh, it, it's not perfect, of course, because a lessee recognises the right of use on its balance sheet rather than the, the whole asset as an owner would. Uh, so another thing that the board did, recognising that some investors are interested in what I will call whole asset values, is put in some disclosure requirements to facilitate the calculation of whole asset values if the entity has bought all of the assets that it is, it is leasing. Uh, so the board required in particular disclosure of uh, depreciation expense by class of right of use assets, which enables investors based on, based on their knowledge of the use of different classes to calculate those whole asset values. So that is another way in which after IFRS 16 ratio analysis changes. And I would think there would be methods uh, whereby you could look at those different scenarios before and after IFRS 16, comparing companies um, and comparing what they'd reported either side of, of the transition, those that bought assets, those that leased assets, and, and, and look into the, the differences in comparability. Um, with apologies, Anna, that was a very long answer, but it was a good question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Um, you, I, I just want to add to that. You mentioned uh, interviews and surveys, and um, it is um, worth emphasizing here that um, a helpful evidence uh, for the board would uh, include uh, evidence from studies that employ a wide range of methods, uh, experiments, surveys, uh, empirical analysis. Uh, so um, this, uh, I thought that was uh, a very good uh, example you pointed there. Um, so moving on uh, to uh, other questions. Um, another question relates to the uh, improvement of uh, 
internal decision making um, for companies as a result of applying IFRS 16. And uh, Katrin, you talked about it uh, when you discussed the, the polling question, but I just wanted to, to add here that um, um, this is uh, a question that uh, has been uh, examined in the academic literature and uh, the literature that looks at the real effects of uh, financial reporting and they have identified such uh, learning effects um, uh, by companies as a result of their own uh, reporting, which I find uh, really interesting. And uh, there is also some uh, survey evidence uh, from uh, where preparers were interviewed and uh, around 70% of them uh, expected that there will be some uh, improvement in their lease uh, management. Uh, but because this was done uh, fairly early, uh, when the standard uh, became uh, effective, it would be interesting to get, uh, it, it is obviously based on expectations and it will be interesting to get uh, some uh, evidence based on the actual data. So, um, 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 Anna, sorry, there, if I may jump in, I, oh, sorry, go on. Yes. Yes, yeah. please. No, I know please. I mentioned this, this earlier, but given that we've had the question, um, maybe I, I could use the opportunity to expand a little. You might tell, uh, you might be able to tell I, I quite like these topics. Um, so, so I talked um, earlier when we looked at the survey about the fact that much like external reporting, in, in order to implement IFRS 16, companies have told us that their internal reporting has also improved and they have better information. Um, a, a very specific example that, um, that I could give that might be something that could be looked into is, for example, uh, the concept of discount rates. So when lessees were accounting for operating leases, they just didn't need to calculate discount rate, whereas now they do. And that's a specific example that might benefit improved decision making. The reason being that leases are, are so much more than accounting. You know, lessees enter into them for, for many reasons and they're, they're beneficial to companies. And in entering into leases, companies will not just be thinking about accounting, they will be really thinking about what is the best economic decision for them. And part of that decision making process will often be comparing the financial consequences of, of leasing relative to buying. And in order to compare that almost, you, you do kind of need a discount rate to do that full analysis. So, so the fact that companies do have that information and are calculating that information for IFRS 16, it does lend itself to, to the kind of information you also need to be making um, sort of evidence decisions um, about your sort of investment in assets. So that's just, you know, another slightly more detailed example of, of the kinds of um, transparency benefits companies are, are seeing internally that might lend themselves to good decision making. Thank you, Katrin. So uh, looking at uh, the questions uh, we have received, uh, there is a question um, relating to the uh, concept of comparability. And uh, it, um, uh, the person who's asked the question says it means different things to different users. And in their opinion, the transition options um, are uh, involve judgment and uh, variability. Um, Katrin or Patrina, would you like to comment on this? I mean, maybe no. Anna, if it makes sense, Patrina here, I'll 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 start with it, and then though, Kath. Catherine, I'm going to ask you to, you know, add to this because, by the way, I'll own up and tell you that Catherine was one that, that developed what are, in my view, wonderful transition requirements. Um, so, so I think that the commentator asked this specifically and hones in on the fact and rightly said, well, aren't there a lot of, isn't there a lot of optionality in the transition requirements of IFRS 16? So, you know, how, how, how why did the board decide that? And if comparability was an issue, why did the board decide to have all that optionality? Well, I think the first thing to say is that 
um, throughout the development of the standard, of course, the change that IFRS 16 brought for lessees is a huge change. You know, it's a, it's a huge change when you see, you know, the numbers, more than 85% of leases not recognised on the balance sheet. You know, worldwide, leases is a very common uh, sort of tool, I'd say, used um, across by, by all companies across different industry sectors and, and particularly by some industry sectors. And, and those sort of the retailers, the airlines, the transport companies, you know, they they can have telecommunications companies, by the way, can have not only thousands of leases, but hundreds of thousands of leases. So the board I hired a lot of feedback just about the sheer, you know, the cost, the complexity of introducing IFRS 16 would have. So the board, of course, tries to find ways of making um, implementation and especially transition first time of applying the standard, you know, to make it practical, but without, by the way, trying to lose too much informational value. And so I suppose to in response to the question, and when we think about informational value for investors, of course, comparability is a big uh, a big issue there. So, so yes, the, the, the person who asked the question is right. There are a lot of transition options and IFRS 16, but when they were developed, they were very much developed as a way to try and provide a significant amount of cost relief for lessees, however, without you know, um, without sort of losing too much in terms of informational value for investors. And I'll maybe just pick up two as examples. One of the, the transitional options in there is that a lessee can decide not to have to immediately impair every right of use asset that it recognises for the first time on transition. It could instead just use its existing onerous contract provision in that case. Because we are thinking if there was any case where a right of use asset might be impaired, the, the lessee should have already recognised an onerous contract provision. In you know, applying the previous standards. So we thought that was a way of reducing a lot of cost, but not changing the informational value too much. Equally, the, the other example I have is that there is an option in there about exactly how a lessee measures the right of use asset when it first applied the standard. And there you might think as a starting point, why create an option? Doesn't that uh, reduce comparability? In this case, no, because when we thought about the, the options here, we would expect um, we would have expected lessees to take the option that looks like the simplest option only where the numbers don't make a big difference. And the reason for that is that the simplest option that takes you away from what might be what you might expect if you had retrospectively applied either. For 16 actually would result in what I'll call um, increased charges in the income statement in the future. So what way the board set that up was would expect people to take that simple option in a sense that moves you away from, from IFRS 16 numbers only in cases where the numbers are really quite small. Um, because it would be detrimental to these lessees to do it where their numbers are big because the effects on their income statement after transition uh, would be detrimental to them. Again, and I'm sorry, I realise I've talked, probably talked too long on that one. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Patrina. Uh, so uh, I think uh, we have... Um, come uh, to the end of uh, the webinar and uh, we won't uh, have time to take more questions but I would like uh, to thank you all for listening and participating today we hope this session has been uh, helpful for you and uh, we'll post a recording of the session on the website uh, in due course and the slides are already there as mentioned uh, previously by Katrin um, I would uh, like to draw your attention uh, that uh, this webinar is one of a series of webinars that um, we're holding. The other two are on IFRS 9, Financial Instruments, and IFRS 15, Revenue from Contracts with Customers. And uh, the purpose of these webinars is to engage uh, with academics and encourage research for the upcoming post-implementation reviews on these uh, three standards. And a number of opportunities in journal special issues and upcoming conferences uh, will provide potential outlets for your research. Details about these um, 
outlets will come out on our um, academic uh, page on the website of uh, the IFRS Foundation. And uh, this will be in the news section. So um, please uh, uh, check these in the next couple of months. They will be coming out. And um, as a final note, uh, in the slides of this presentation, there are links uh, to some materials that you may find useful and are relevant uh, to the issues discussed today. Um, so on behalf of me and all my colleagues that participated today, I would like to thank you again and goodbye.